Uh, my name is Nadine Greinig, and I'm the former director of Indian Education for the state of Arizona. Uh, and I'm currently working for Save Our Schools Arizona Network as their tribal outreach consultant. And I am also the CEO of the Southwestern Institute for the Education of Native Americans, or Siena for short. So um, we today are uh, doing our series, Speaking of Schools for Save Our Schools Arizona. And the topic today is achieving, if I can speak right, achieving educational equity for indigenous students. And our speakers today are Superintendent Dr. Deborah Dennison from San Carlos Unified School District and Mr. Quincy Nate from Chinle Unified School District. So I'll begin with uh, giving you short bios on both of them and then they can introduce themselves as well. So uh, Quincy Nate grew up in poverty in the town of Chinle, Arizona on the Navajo Reservation. After finishing his K-12 education at Chinle High School, he went on to complete a bachelor's degree in business administration and then later earned an MBA. Understanding firsthand the benefits of education, he has dedicated his life to creating those same opportunities for generations of Navajo students attending Chinle Unified School District. In his 23-year career in school finance, he led many construction projects that have culminated in CUSD students having the opportunity to learn in some of the finest school facilities in Arizona. The most well-known facility that was built under his leadership is the Wildcat Den, which was featured recently in the Netflix series, Basketball or Nothing. <clears throat> now in his eighth year as the CUSD superintendent, he has successfully led district staff in developing strategic planning processes, resulting in pivotal strategies that manifested in historic changes in student achievement and have begun to close the achievement gap. This work has manifested in student pass rates on the Arizona State Assessment more than doubling in both ELA, English Language Arts, and Math between 2014 and 2019. The increase in the percentage of students passing in CUSD in both ELA and Math is more than twice the average increase for Arizona. That's quite a feat. Our other speaker, Dr. Deborah De Jackson Dennison, is of Scottish descent of the McPherson clan on her mother's side. And I'll let her introduce herself, uh, her Navajo clan, because there's no way I can pronounce it right <laughs> on her father's side. So she is the superintendent, as I mentioned, of San Carlos Unified School District. She has a doctorate in educational leadership and policy studies from Arizona State University. Dr. Dennison is a lifelong educator who believes passionately in the ideology of continuous improvement for quality and excellence in education for Indigenous students. In 2010, Dr. Jackson Dennison was appointed pre by President Barack Obama to the National Advisory Council on Indian Education, and she continues to serve as the chair of that council. Dr. Jackson Dennison has been the superintendent of Ganado Unified and Window Rock Unified School Districts, with Window Rock being her alma mater. There, she employed the embracing change for student leadership systemic reform model to better correlate with the Navajo philosophy of lifelong learning while encompassing the components of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act for her Navajo students to have the quality education system they wholeheartedly deserve. So I will start with Dr. I mean, to, with Mr. Nate, if you'd like to say a little bit more about yourself. Good afternoon and Yate. She Quincy Nate Yen Shia, Kachin in Shlon, Twitchin in Bashish Ching, my Deskis Nade, Asha Chase, and Najinade Asha Nala. I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's uh, live stream. Um, my name is Quincy Nate. I'm born for red running into the water. My fathers are bitter water people. And Yate is, is hello, and I hope all is well in Navajo. Welcome. Thank you. And Dr. Dennison. Good evening, everyone. I'll start with an Apache introduction. Lagote, <laughs> since I'm serving the San Carlos Apache students right now, but the Yacht A from my own um, homelands, which is Navajo. And um, my, my, as you said, my Scottish clan is my, the McPherson clan, which is my uh, mother's clan. And then my uh, paternal clan, my father's clan is Ushi, or Kiaani, with my paternal grandfather being Ushi. So I'm in my um, 17th year as a superintendent, and I'm excited to be a part of what you're doing here. So thank you for welcome for inviting us to be here, inviting me to be here. 
I'm so glad you both could join us today. I, I know that you've achieved a lot of success in your careers and, and you're not done yet. <laughs> Although you may wish you were. <laughs> right. There are many challenges, of course, added to your, your plate with COVID-19 um, coming along as, as well as, uh, you know, being a challenge for everybody, of course, in this country and beyond. So, but today we're talking about educational equity. You know, there's equity in many different forms and many different um, areas, but we want to focus on uh, education right now because, of course, that's where your areas of expertise lie. And um, before we got started, Superintendent Nate asked about equality as well. And so maybe we need to make a, as we go along, we'll make a distinction between equality and equity because they are not the same thing. And I know I found out um, when I was at the Department of Education, when I was presenting to the state legislators, they clearly didn't understand, a lot of them did not understand the difference. Um, they said, we give everybody the same thing. Everybody gets the same amount of money or, you know, per student or whatever. And that's not necessarily true either. But uh, everybody is not equal and everybody does not have equitable services. So um, giving somebody the same thing as somebody else who needs more or something different is not, not the same. So that would, that would be more along the lines of, of providing equity when you do give the student who needs more exactly what they need. So our first question for you to, to discuss is what does educational equity mean to you? So um, I'll go ahead and go uh, with, let's see, should we go handsome before pretty? So we'll go with Superintendent Nate. <laughs> what does education, equity mean in education? Well, I you know, coming from a community or being in a community and working in a community where um, there's a high rate of unemployment of 60%, um, it, it makes it difficult to get across why education is important because the outlook is, is, is somewhat grim. And so, so in order to create that equity is how do you offer those opportunities? What do you do to offer opportunities for your students to recognize that education is the pathway to, to uh, having a better life, not only for yourself, but also your family. And so because of the limited resources, it makes it difficult to meet those equity challenges that we have. Um, and so, yes, I'll use internet as an example. The infrastructure here is horrible and we're going virtual to start a school year. Um, in some minds, not having internet may not be an equity issue, but because of the lack of resources in our area, it does become an equity issue because of the infrastructure not being present and prevalent in, in our communities, even to the point where there's, there's a number of uh, areas that have no Wi-Fi at all. Um, and if you do have Wi-Fi, I mean, I have really good Wi-Fi to my house. I have four megabytes. That kind, that kind of speaks to, that speaks to the connectivity issues we have in our community. And so, how do we increase our resources so we can provide those opportunities is, is a huge challenge, I think, with um, reaching equity as far as um, for native, native population across the nation. It's the students who um, are required to learn online because of COVID or who are required to take homework home with them and it involves maybe looking something up on the internet. If they don't have access to the internet, they're out of luck. Not necessarily. So the way we, we create that, that equity is what we've done. My district uh, covers roughly 4,200 square miles. And so what we're doing is we're, we're number one, providing hotspots. So we're providing hotspots for those students that have connectivity as a way to increase that, that, that equity. The other is, and is we're placing, strategically placing buses with hotspots on them so that parents, parents are going to have to be involved and drive them maybe a mile or two to reach that destination so they have connectivity. Last but not least, all lessons are gonna be required to be recorded. And so we'll download them on a flash drive and deliver those to the students. So that's a way that we create that equity is leveraging the resources we have so that everybody, you know, trying to level the playing field for everybody so that they have same access. And last but not least, you know, we'll, we'll, we may have to use paper packets like we did the last nine weeks. So. That's how we're going to try to meet the demands that are in our community. Your packets, okay. So, <clears throat> so providing educational equity means giving the students the things that they need that every other student has in order to be able to achieve academically. Would that be a good 
sum up? Yes, I agree. Okay, great. Dr. Dennison, what do you think about uh, what educational equity means? That's been educational equity for indigenous students goes really deep. Um, it's something that even in my own doctoral dissertation, I looked at. And the reason why there's, it goes back to similar to what uh, Mr. Nate was saying, but the, the value for education at the, at the home level has to really be uh, worked with in, in this case. Um, that's what I'm finding in this COVID era, because as, we're, as he's speaking of Chen Li, we're not as huge, but we still have the same challenges and probably even deeper because of the historical trauma that exists out in the school community where, where I'm from, or where I've been working, not where I'm from, but where I've been working these last five years that I've been there. And so it's just, um, it's, gonna be a, it's gonna be a challenge, but we're doing similar things to what Mr. Nate is doing in Chin Lee, where we're, we're provided laptops, we're providing laptops. We did that the whole night, the last quarter, the fourth quarter. Um, but equity in education for native kids goes back to the historical trauma, like I said, and we have to design a system. The system has to meet the needs of the community in order to bring equity in, if, if even then. Um, but it's really hard when the mindsets are uh, on the way, maybe my generation, um, I'm a grandmother now, so even my children's generation, the way they were, the way they were brought up or the way we were brought up, our grandparents were brought up to think about education and learning. So this is, that's where the biggest challenge is gonna be in my view is really getting the parent involvement piece. So fortunately for, for San Carlos and what we've been working on uh, for the last five years is the systemic reform, the system meeting the needs. So you have to really learn the demographics of your community and understand um, really what the challenges are. You have to really work with the tribal council and the, and the community on what the needs are and identify those needs and then go from there. And you can't even think about the scores yet when you're starting this process. And that's what I've learned. And the scores will come on their own. We're just now getting there in San Carlos when this COVID hit. So now it's gonna be a challenge as to really, and I, I, I like to present it that way to my staff is that it's, it's really helping us look deeper at the issue of parent involvement, parent uh, really having that voice of what's happening in, with their students because it's giving that ownership back to the parents again as to what what's going on with their kids at school and not just sending them to school like like many generations have done uh, just sending them off to school or even back historically to even my father's generation where they were taken away from their parents and shipped off to school to to learn a trade and to be able to you know that whole history impacts the here and now and so that's been my whole push ever since I started as a school administrator is pushing to, to design a system that meets the community needs. And it's not, it's not easy at all. It's really hard because you have beliefs, you have uh, uh, even internal beliefs that think otherwise, that, that they don't want to change because they think it, if the system was good enough for me, it should be good enough for my kids. So right now with COVID, it's really putting that spotlight on the issues that we're facing right, right front and center. And so I, I'm really proud that we're prepared. I feel like we're prepared in San Carlos because we've been working on it for a while now. So we know where those systemic issues are and we've adjusted our system to meet those needs. That's great, thank you. Um, we did a, a panel discussion we have through Save Our Schools Arizona. I host a Indigenous Perspectives series that we just started last week. And uh, Dr. Gabriel Trujillo, who's the superintendent of Tucson Unified School District, was talking about a lot of the same things that you, you both have mentioned. And he did talk about, it's not, you know, you have all these symptoms. You have dropout, high dropout rates, uh, low retention. You've got tardiness. You've got discipline issues, you've got all kinds of things. Um, but if you only look at those and only deal with those, you're not going to get very far. You have to deal with the causes of the beneath those symptoms. And so I think what you're talking about with historical trauma and, and all the things that our kids deal with today before they even get to school, 
and uh, are the things that you have to look at. And like you said, kind of create, look at the system and make modifications to it to meet those needs. And yeah, parent involvement has been a big, big issue for a long time. And now it's even more important, as you said. So they have to, they have to collaborate and cooperate with the school district, if, even if it's just driving a bus, like you said, to, to get to a hot spot. So um, Superintendent Nate, how do we help? How does the community help? How does society as a whole help to help indigenous communities heal from the social emotional impact and consequences of, of historical trauma and the lack of equity, the historical lack of equity for native students? And you're on mute, by the way. So. <laughs> I'm going to build on something Dr. Dennison mentioned, and that's, um, I think it begins with us as ind Indigenous people. We need to begin to identify leaders within our own community and have the confidence and trust that they know what's best for our students because they know very well what the needs are in the community. Um, and oftentimes in Native community, we're our own worst critic. And so it makes it very difficult. So it begins with us as the community. What do we really want for our students as, as Native uh, people, Indigenous people? Um, do we really want a quality education? I'll give you an example. In my 23 years before I became the superintendent, I had 12 bosses. So that tells you the constant turnover that occurs. And you see that all over Navajo. That there's, a, there's like a musical chairs we move around. Um, for me to be here for eight years, that's, that's a long time to be in one place on Navajo. And so it's developing that confidence that you're bringing in the right individual, somebody that knows your community or is willing to learn, take the time and learn about the community so that you begin to identify the needs and speaking, you know, about what Dr. Trujillo said, yes, you can focus on those areas, drop out uh, scores, whatnot, but if you really don't identify the basic needs in your community, you're going to be, um, you're, it's a losing battle for you because you have to address those needs initially. And so historical trauma, if you understand historical trauma um, and, and the impacts it has on, you know, it's generational, it goes from one generation to the gen next generation, and you begin to provide um, education on how we can change that. Um, it's, it's there, you know, you can't um, get away from it, but you can improve the circumstances for your students. So I think it begins with our own communities developing that trust and faith in our own people that we can do it because we know best what, you know, what's happening in our communities. We know the needs in our communities. So I think that's a way you would address that is, is, is begin looking within and identifying those people in, in, in your own community on how can we make these changes for the better of our students. I would agree with that. Uh, for generations, we've had non-Native people come onto our lands and lands they've removed us to, not necessarily where we originally came from telling us they know how to, how to save us, how to you know, make us better people or different, whatever it might be. And clearly that hasn't worked. So I think, like you said, people in the community know who they are. They know what their challenges are, what the difficulties are. Also, they know what's good. They know what works. They know what uh, inspires. They know what gets people excited. They know their own sense of humor, which can go a long way toward you know, helping their children and themselves get a better education. So, um, Dr. Dennison, do you have any uh, ideas about that, about yeah. how people well, can help? Sure. Yeah, I think that's called the vested interest. I always like to refer to it as the vested interest in the community. And it, it can be a non-native or someone that comes in, but that, that thinking that someone else has all the answers is what's hurt us the most. And so when we look to look internally and we find a leader from within that truly has that vested interest that's really i mean important even in the roles of principalships the roles of teachers because we have our children that look up to them as leaders they think hey i can be that person too and i think that's something that's the mindset that has to go back and look look at from some point of view, I mean, to give a different point of view and have these type of sessions where we talk about it and bring it up. And so that, you know, we, why do we think the way we think? Why do we believe the way we believe? And it's something I always tell my own children. Um, 
because I'm a, I'm a mother of three and I always think it depends on who you're hanging out with and who you're talking to that believe a certain way that is like the same kind of the same kind of idea there is that you know we have to really and it goes to the school boards of understanding what the issues are and educating the community about what it is that school systemic reform really is for Indian country and um, getting their input because when again from my experience it you can never get where you want to go unless you ask the people what they want so I, I always say that whenever we're doing our work with the tribal council or with the people from the community is that the, the tribe in fact my own research again talking about asking the question what do you want your San Carlos Apache students to know and be able to do when they graduate from San Carlos High School. What is it that you you want? And it's hard for them to answer because they've been so ingrained in Western education beliefs and thoughts that and 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 the way they've been brought up, you know. So it's really hard to change that mindset to think that, wow, I would like my son or my daughter to, you know, not not just go to college or all the things that we strive for, but to just be successful, to be happy, to be content, to be able to, um, yes, make a living at what they love to do, but that's just it. What is it that they love to do? And so all of that, um, to know how to read, to write, you know, all these basic things that we know are across the country needed, but at the same time that they're able to function in whatever society that they choose they want to function in. And that's something that I think, again, historically has never happened in Indian education and in very, very little, I don't want to say it's never happened, but I know that that's been one of the things that I've always pushed for is you ask the question to tribal people, to tribal leaders, to tribal um, community members that are out there. What do you want? Because we're always told what to do, whether it's ADE or the State Department or US Department of Education, we're told you're going to learn these standards, you're going to do this, this, this but we never ask the parents, these are their children, this is their community, what do they want for their community? And then go from there and try to integrate that into what's, what we're being asked to do or told to do from the higher up in Western education. That's the real basic clash right there that in my view has been what's hurt us most. And, but, so when you give them a voice and you give the, even the students themselves a voice, um, it's, it's powerful. It's very powerful, and that's what, that's been my experience in the different school districts that I've worked in. Yeah, I was going to ask about that, the students, because we've mentioned up until that point everybody, superintendents, principals, teachers, uh, counselors, but yeah, getting the students input too is really important, I, I think. And I know you know this, that it's amazing what can come from their, you know, from them, their thoughts and ideas and how to achieve things. It's like, Wow, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> you know, so there's wisdom in the in the youth as well. Um, so how, you, you brought up ADE. You know, you know, I used to work there, and I did my best to you know with uh, the, the few resources we had. No, um, had a half time person, and no funding from the state uh, depart um, from the uh, state legislature. They never appropriated any funding for the office of Indian Education. So. Where do you think the responsibility for educational equity lies in terms of leadership at that level, at the state legislature, at the uh, Department of Education, or, or any other group that you know, might be able to influence uh, whether or not our students get what they need? Either one of you can respond to that question. If you'd rather yeah, leave go, the I'll, pivot, I'll then that's okay. I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> I always go back to um, my Scottish grandpa. His name was uh, Joseph McPherson, and he came from. Uh, well, he was a he was a, appointed to the Navajo Nation to serve as an attorney general um, years back, and he brought my mom, and so that whole thing. But he always would say, "Nobody's going to do it except for you. You're going to have to." If he he was the one that really uh, worked to to introduce the Navajo Preference and Employment Act. And so when you think about that, or Indian preference, if you wanna take it out broader, um, that comes from 
sure from a legal standpoint, but the message was, and that that's where, you know, my, my mother's husband, my dad took that to heart and made certain he became educated enough to be able to go back and do the work that he did. And so that's the value that I carry and that I like to share with people, the, my own community where I work and encouraging them, you know, get, get what you need to get the paper that, that Western education provides so that you can go back and do what you believe you need to get done. Um, that is where, in my view, is what it's our responsibility as indigenous people to, and, and a lot of what we stumble across is just a lack of knowledge. And we can call it all kinds of things. We can call it that, you know, ignorance or whatever, but really it is, it's up to us to educate, um, whether it's the state level, whether it's the federal level, wherever it is that we have to work, we have to educate and constantly, and we do that, Quincy and I, Mr. Nate and I always do that within our roles, I know that. We're always educating um, at the federal level, at the state level, to make certain things can get, get accomplished at what we need to get accomplished because without that, it's not gonna get, nobody's gonna come in and do it for us and it always goes back to what my my late grandfather shared that teaching. And in, it, and in that very teaching is also a Navajo, a Navajo teaching of you have to take care of it yourself and do it yourself. Don't depend on other people to do it for you. I would, I would agree with, um, with um, Dr. Dennison's grandfather. It begins with us. We, we have to take the lead. We can no longer sit back and say, why not us? Why not me? In Navajo, it's Shishan. What about me? Um, and so we need to break down those barriers and walls and have the confidence to go to the state level, go to the national level and speak on behalf of your students, share with them and educate what is really happening on Navajo, in my, in my case, what is really happening in the community of Chin Lee, educating them that the state line is not I-40, it goes beyond that. And there are children up there that we need to, we need to acknowledge number one and provide resources for it. And so I, I agree hundred percent. It begins with us as native people that we need to begin to step out more and, and you're seeing it happen more and more. That tide is starting to change. And so, you know, with that comes changes and at the department of education, I don't know, you know what it was, but I mean, you do see more resources, not, not the level that it needs to be, but at least now it's beginning to happen. And so it starts with advocacy we, and we have to do that as, as native leaders, we need to be able to step up and say, okay, I'm gonna advocate for my students in my community, at the, at the local level, at the state level, and then and most importantly, at the national level as well. Yeah, I totally agree with that as well. Um, when I, years ago, when I uh, first started the nonprofit Sienna, we had an educational conference for students in seventh and 12th grade, and it was called Take Charge, Native American Leadership Today. And so we taught the students uh, gave them resources and ways to take charge of their own lives, basically, to, but of course, with resources and assistance to do that. So they understand that it's up to them. You know, they're not going to be educated through osmosis. You know, they can't just go to a classroom and come out more knowledgeable. They have to participate and find ways, you know, to achieve their goals um, through counselors and, you know, adult mentors and people like that, their educators as well. So, um, what would you say uh, the future holds for students, any students, but of course, indigenous students without equitable education? In other words, we already know that Native American students, at least in Arizona and probably across the country, achieve at the bottom in terms of uh, when you look at subgroups. Uh, so they achieve at the bottom academically in math and English language arts. And I know that you've achieved some uh, some level of success in moving your students up in that regard. But if they don't, if students don't have, I know you don't have everything that you would like or that you need or all of your students need to have. So without that, if, we, if these students never get it, where are they gonna end up? Or, or what do you think the future holds for them? And do you think it's even possible for every student to achieve equity in education? I, I believe it's possible. Um, I think it's possible and, and, and education is the way that you make that happen. Um, when we started our journey here in Chin Lee, I mean, I, we, I have several teachers 
classrooms throughout my district that at or above the state average in math and ELA. Um, and, and, but when we started the journey, there was a lot of uh, disbelief that it could be done. We can't, these kids can't do it. Um, you know, we're required to follow standards. The, the pacing's too high, the rigor's too fast, the pacing's too fast, these kids can't do it. We don't get support from home. And so I think, you know, you have to change the culture within your, your school setting so that you create that belief system and you leverage those small wins, those vicarious experiences and let them know it can be done. In my district, I'm very fortunate to have about 70% of my teaching, my 230 teachers that are Navajo or Native American. And so I have excellent role models. And so again, I, well, let's go back to the question of equity. You need to understand what are the needs. So in, in Arizona, they don't fund preschool. We started a preschool program for our four-year-olds to give them that jump start, And so that's how we do it is, is we recognize the needs that are in your community and we make those changes and you create that culture, that positive culture in your building and you, and you begin to see that transition. And so now we know we can do it. Now we know that we have the ability to be very successful. And I tell my staff this time and time again, my goal and my vision is of the 200 seniors we graduate every year, I hope 20 of them come back into our community. And whether they're a teacher, whether they're a principal, whether they're a superintendent, whether they're a doctor or a nurse, an entrepreneur, they come back and they make a difference in my community. And those 20 every year coming back with their education, their skills, their trades that they've learned can change the socioeconomic status in our community. And that's how we do it. And that's how we make a difference. Great, Dr. Dennison. I agree the same with the same thing that Mr. Nate said, um, and I, I I'm so I was just thinking the other day and talking about how blessed I am to have gone to San Carlos at the time when I left Window Rock. I I, I didn't think I would want to do it again. I started my own business like you're doing. It's similar to um, it's called Indigenous Ingenuity, and I started to work with some other tribes besides Navajo, but going to San Carlos and doing the other tribes that I've worked with, I, I see the same thing. I, mean, I, I see that too, as Mr. Nate mentioned, as Navajo people, we're so fortunate. On the flip side, we should, we should be very, we should be so fortunate to be able to make certain those jobs exist for our graduates when they come back and that we treat them with respect when they come back. Um, I see out in, the experiences I've had, I probably would have never left Navajo. I don't think I would have because that was where, you know, I really felt like I, I needed to be. But as things happen, you know, I ended up in San Carlos and it's just been such a rewarding experience to see, uh, to help the community to do just that, to be able to uh, see those um, leaps and bounds of growth being made because we were at the bottom, the very bottom. And it happens because it's not so much that nobody cares. It's just the fact that nobody's brought to light what can be done. And that belief factor that Mr. Nate talked about, that too is so important. I mean, to be, we, we can't do that. You know, you hear people say that. They might not say it directly, but you can see their body language like, what? You know, and or years and years of taking advantage of a school system and trying to change the culture of that system to for internal people that are local from there uh it's it's a really hard thing to do and uh i'm i'm just really pleased to have gone there and to be able to to at least plant that seed there i mean i'm not from there and i i know i'm an outsider even though i'm 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 a native american woman um i know that one day someone's gonna have to take over uh, i can't stay there forever so there again, it's just like what was mentioned already. You groom somebody to take the place of the superintendent as the superintendent leaves, or you're you're making certain that as you leave, things can go on. So there's some there's some continuity and some stability, and um, it the it's rooted deep. That seed that was planted is rooted deep for for that to happen, and so the results will be there. I'm sure, just as Chin Lee's experiencing. Uh, this is my fifth year. This is starting my fifth year there. The changes are are huge and the excitement is in the air and I, I'm seeing that you know 
the students are wanting to come back and work at the school system. And so just encouraging them to, again, get their, their degrees and go to school. And just it's, just it's just a remarkable thing to see happen when you give them, like I said in the earlier question, you give them a voice, you give them the, the, the ability to envision what could be when maybe in the past they never really thought of it that way. That's really the, the whole idea of equity and bringing it to light. Um, it's just very, very exciting work in that sense. And I just did a presentation yesterday or the other day, and I have a slide that says COVID hits and then, but we're going to be able to, we're going to be able to get through it. So you give them hope, you give your staff, you give your community, you give everyone hope that we will, we will get through this. No, it's not going to be easy, but we're still going to make it through because we, we are equipped now We're we're designed to, to handle this. And so, you know, you just can't give up and say, Hey, forget it. We're, we're not going to make it. And because in, in many cases, that's what's happened um, to not just, uh, you know, across the nation with in Indian education, it's so easy to say, it's just, it's not going to work. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to do it. Um, there's no giving up when it comes to uh, the push of, what we want, what we expect. I guess if the expectations are there, they're going to rise to the expectations. That's the point. Exactly. Yes, they are. If you hold the bar high, and they'll reach for it. But if you don't, if your expectations of them are that they won't make it, then chances are they won't, unless they have extremely strong support at home and a strong will and and other um, people to help bring them up. Um, but you're right. Sometimes we can be our own worst enemy. You know, I. I, I you, when you go off the reservation, you go to school, you go to college, get a degree, and you want to go back to your home community, it doesn't always work out because, well, my sister, for example, she's the oldest of the six of us, and she's full-blooded Laguna. I'm half. Um, when she got her master's degree in library science, there was an opening in the tribal library. She went back and applied, and they wouldn't hire her. You know, she was qualified. She was from the community. She was eager to work there but they saw her as different now and that she didn't fit in and i've heard lots of stories in, in the years i've been working in education about you know, similar stories to that so when you can set up an atmosphere in your school to begin with with when the kids are young that this is what we have to do we have to support each other we can do this we can do this together you know don't pick on each other don't bully um, when someone's trying to learn navajo in, or apache um, don't tease somebody if they don't say it right, because that could discourage them. I know that happened to me trying to learn Laguna. So yeah, if you can set up that atmosphere, I mean, all thing, all kinds of things can be accomplished. And you guys are seeing that. You're, you're good examples of that happening already in your communities. And then what a life lesson that these children can learn can learn when they can get through COVID, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and, and still get their education and still achieve and still improve and you know, that's going to carry them a long way uh, in life, you know, to see that, that they can get through it. So I commend both of you for your attitudes, for your knowledge, for your, you know, your sticking to it and being innovative and everything that you have to. And of course, the people that work in your school districts, like you said, that the team has to be on board. The team has to, you know, if you get even one naysayer that can influence others and then you're not, and you have to, I know as superintendents, you have to keep an eye on those things too, to make sure that that doesn't happen. So I'm going to check with Kate now and see if we have, we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, see if we have any questions. Let's see, Kate is our S SO, our Save Our Schools Arizona IT person, although she is a music teacher by profession. <laughs> they needed an IT person. So let's see. All right, I guess she's supposed to send those to me. I haven't seen one yet. So is there anything else while we have you, um, you two paragons of Indian education on the line? Do either of you have anything that you would like to, to talk about or share that we haven't covered yet? Well, I, okay, I'll start. Um, you know, I, I, I just want to speak about natives in general. I mean, when you look back at historical um, trauma, you know, one positive 
attribute that we have learned is the concept of being very resilient. I mean, despite what has happened, despite, you know, um, the government um, um, position on natives in general, uh, taking our lands, um, tribes in general are bouncing back. And so we have that innate ability in us, it's ingrained in us, it's in our DNA that we're gonna be okay and we're gonna be successful. Um, and we have that ability. And with this pandemic, you know, in our communities, and, and as people probably know, Navajo was hit pretty hard, we bounced back. You know, we're not where we need to be, but we're way better than where we were, you know, a month ago. Uh, you know, so again, it just speaks to our, our resiliency as, as Native people. And I think that's something you know, in all Native communities, we need to build upon and use that and leverage that. You know, if we want to make change within our community, we have to understand, number one, that we're very resilient people and, and we have the ability to bounce back. And so I think if you understand that about Native people, um, you know, the sky's the limit. Anything's possible. And then our education environment is very possible to create that success. And something you met, mentioned, Nadine, is creating that belief system. Within that belief system, you know, we now speak to our kindergarten students, you're going to college. You create those, those conversations that they can take home. And my teacher says, I'm going to college. And mom's like, well, what are you talking about? You know, we don't go to college. And then they begin to wonder, well, what's happening in the school system? I need to figure out why my son, daughter's coming home saying I'm going to college. And that's how you create that parental involvement and create that idea, that idea, plant that seed so that it grows. And the belief system in the family now, wow, my son and daughter can go to college. And so you create that tradition within your school that that's, that's what we're about in education in Chinle Unified School District. So, so I just you know, wanted to add that as well too, that that's something that we need to remember is we're a very resilient people and, and we can and will be successful. Yes, and um, that's something that's very important to share uh, are examples of that resiliency from history up till current day, you know, people, uh, strong leaders that we've had, leaders that fought for what they believed in. Um, some of them may have perished eventually, but they, we still know about them today because of what they did and what they achieved, what they stood for. You know, and if you remind the students that they, those are their ancestors, that they have their blood in them, that they can do the same thing. So it's just instilling a, a, some pride and self-worth in the students and, and to, as I tell them, that you know they're worthy of achieving anything that they want to achieve, you know, just as much as any other student. So um, I don't have a question yet, but I do have a comment from Myron Sosi, who you were smiling, so you must yeah, know. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, he's a representative Sosi with Arizona legislature and also one of my school board members. Oh, okay. Well, he made a comment. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. So he says, I'm proud to represent Chin Lee. I hold everyone to high expectations. I tell them we do not need to depend on the federal government because we can do it ourselves using our indigenous teachings. We aren't going to be handed equity on a silver platter. We must show that we will not give up. So that's exactly what we've been talking about. All right, well, I was hoping we'd have more questions or questions, but maybe we've just answered all of the questions. Um, I, I do wanna go back to a, a subject um, that you kind of peripherally brought up, uh, Superintendent Nate. Uh, you said that you have 70% Native American uh, or Navajo uh, teachers at Chinle. Did I hear that right? That's correct, yes. So um, one of the things that I've discussed with, with higher ed and you know, other Indian education stakeholders is to you know, grow your own, grow your own Indian educators um, for a number of reasons. And the difficulty, at least in Arizona, is that our, a lot of our native, uh, our graduates of colleges of education, pre-service teachers, can't pass the state certification to become you know, certified to teach in Arizona. And so that was something that we wanted to, to try to address, um, but didn't get the chance to. One of the things that, that came up was, I believe it's the state of Utah actually requires their um, college graduates who are going into education to pass the certification to, in order to graduate. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And what can universities do to help their Native American um, 
pre-serve as teachers pass the assessment? I think there needs to be an effort to made as far as uh, preparing this, the, um, the future teacher, um, you know, what to expect on the exam. I mean, let's look at uh, assessing native students in general. We tend to do very, you know, not as well, yes. um, but we have the possibility to do good. But I think if you provide the right support and resources, they can and will be successful. Um, uh, something that's different in Arizona, as you know, Nadine, is they allow us to emergency certify teachers. And yeah. they've even changed their requirements that if you're in a position for three years, you can you you don't have to take the test. You can be get a standard provisional. So what we've done is there's some outstanding teachers coming out of various institutions, and they've they've um, sought employment with us. And so we've identified those students, those teachers, that tend to do very well. Number one, they have the innate ability to create relationships in the classroom. In my opinion, that's something that is huge with our students. And so if they can make that initial connection, um, they see the results come. And so I've identified those teachers that are able to do that and that are successful. And so we'll work hard to make sure they get, we encourage them to take the test every year, but we also are willing to take a gamble and say, okay, I'll, I will certify you three years in a row and get you a standard certificate. And we keep them and maintain them in our system. And that's one way we've been in, able to increase our, um, numbers of native students that are that are in our district I'm, I'm sorry native teachers that are in our district so that's something we've we've leveraged and implemented here in chinley great yeah that's something that i yeah was aware of and i also wondered how that would work uh, and if you would be able to get really good teachers that way because you're right it is a lot about the connection from teacher teacher to student uh, dr dennison what do you do at san carlos unified to to support that effort in san carlos it's not nearly, in fact, we, Chin Lee was doing a presentation, Mr. Nate and his team were doing a presentation last December and I had some students with me at, a pre, at the presentation and they, and they mentioned that, that factor that they have 70%. And my, my students, my kids were just so impressed with that. Like, wow, 70% of their teachers are Navajo? And I told them that, that that's been in the making for a long time. And one day you're gonna be presenting up there as, as a superintendent or as a teacher, or as it kind of goes back to the last question we were talking about, putting it in their mind, putting the role models out there. Um, they were so impressed with that, that statistic because in San Carlos, again, it, it, it's never been the push up until now. And so I, as I was explaining to those those kids that were with me, those students that were with me, it's going to be you that does it. You're going to be coming back to your community and carrying on these positions and being teachers and encouraging others to do the same thing. Uh, as far as the test, I know when I was in Window Rock, that was and Ganado, that was a real issue. So I was I was glad that when they did the three year, it was possible. Uh, what we did in San Carlos was um, we took advantage of the uh, because where we're really pushing for the uh, one of my one of my thinkings is also supporting the the immersion concept of learning so we started an immersion kindergarten and i was using the model that we have and that we started in window rock and so i sent a team of my teachers there to window rock i also sent them to chin lee to look at their preschool because the new principal was coming in and we we're going to do a preschool this year. We're still starting it, even though we're having this pandemic. I don't know how well it's going to work, but we're going to start it anyway. Might as well get in there and do it. And so um, the what we did in San Carlos, the tribal chairman and, you know, they approved the, the, the certificate for Apache language teachers. So they were, they went ahead and approved. One of the things that I didn't know when I first got there was that they were paid less than a regular certified teacher. So we put together the curriculum and the, the push for them to be able to get certified after their, you know, meet all the requirements that the state has put out, but for the chairman to be able to sign off on their certificate and then pay them equal pay as a regular teacher certified through the state department. So the board did approve that a couple years ago now. And it's really exciting because it, it motivated them. Um, so that was a start. Like I said, I'm just planting seeds right now, but I, I know because I look at Chinle, I look at Window Rock, I look at Ganado, I look at the places up north where, where I'm from and I see what can be. 
And I, I see that one day we'll be there because uh, that seed's been planted and I'm really excited to see that happen. Um, even hiring back some of the students that have graduated this year to do work within the summertime and to do work during their summer times when they're home is, is a goal that we're setting to put in place. That is very exciting. That's very important for even superintendents to have role models or, or models for what's working in other school districts that you can possibly borrow from, especially if there's similar demographics to your own. Um, so I would imagine also that um, bring, bringing on native student, I mean, sorry, native teachers would uh, increase your retention rate of students, I keep saying students, teachers overall. Is that the case? In Chinle, it is. I mean, it, it, we have um, teachers that retire from here. Once they're here, they tend not to leave. Um, so that that um, trend is here, and so I would I would agree that I don't have to worry about the turnover rate. Um, we, on an average year, probably turn over ten to ten to twenty teachers a year, um, and so, ironically, you know, with the teacher shortage shortage out there. This is the best year we've had in, in, in terms of hiring staff. So, so but, but if we're able to get a native teacher here, they're familiar with the community. You don't have the culture shock that occurs. I've experienced teachers, uh, a U-Haul comes in on a Friday, you check into their apartment and that Monday, the U-Haul is headed out of, on US Highway 191 because this is not what they signed up for. So I think if they're a, a native, they tend to stay and, and so it helps with teacher retention. Yeah, so I had a question about, um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Dennison. The same thing with administrators. Uh, it's really important to have leadership, your leadership team to understand the community. That's really essential as well, uh, so that you know they, they work to hire native or the local people as teachers. Yeah, we did some focus studies. We did three focus group studies in Arizona and one in Nevada and one in Utah asking educators about, um, we were trying to identify best practices for educating Native American students because we wanted to know if it was different from the best practices that are out there because the assumption is that it would be. And so um, some of the things that you've talked about, you know, making that connection to the community, letting, being a presence in the community so the parents and family members and other people in the community, adults see that you are engaged in the community and we tried to uh, we did professional development on that and how to become engaged, how to, uh, we did role modeling. I wrote scripts for people uh, to, to read, put people in the opposite role that they were in. So a, a non-native teacher would play the role of a native person in, within the school and vice versa. So they could get an idea of questions to ask or, or ways to operate, ways to be invited or go with someone to a, a powwow or the rodeo or something like that in order to to get to you know to be known by the community and to know the community uh, and there were some a bunch of other things that we came up with as well um, what about the the argument for diversity uh, um, teachers with different backgrounds ethnic backgrounds or, or racial backgrounds um, providing um, diversity and uh, culturally inclusive kind of classroom or environment. Uh, it may be more difficult to do on a reservation. But what are your thoughts on that? I, I think I'll it's a, say, go ahead, Dr. Denison. Go ahead. No, you go. <laughs> <laughs> you, want me to, you want me to go? Okay. I, I think it's important um, because it's it, having individuals from different backgrounds, I think is, I mean, we're in a unique situation. I have 70% na native, but at the same time, my non-native teachers, they provide um, insight for my students to understand that it's not just all native and you're on a reservation. So when you leave the reservation, you're gonna experience that. And you need to be open to other, other cultures. You need to be open-minded about it. It's not just the, you know, you respect your own culture, you, you, uh, you live it, but you also respect other cultures. And so that's something I think that's important, you know, as a lifelong, le life lear uh, long learning lesson for our students. So I think, I think it's important that you have that in your buildings. And so um, I'll let you go, Dr. Dennis, and do it. Maybe you can answer this question. Um, so what do you do for those 
uh, non-native teachers to do the kinds of things I talked about, to support them feeling comfortable so they don't take that U-Haul, you know, and turn right around without unpacking it. You know, what kinds of things do you offer to those teachers? Well, we, we have, we're in a unique situation for a while there in San Carlos. We were probably the, the district that employed the most immigrant teachers, teachers from another country, mainly the Philippines. We had some um, Indian teachers also. We still have them. And uh, so <laughs> we're, we're, that's why I say looking at, that's why the students that were with me when they heard that statistic of Chin Lee having 70% native or Navajo, um, it, it, it really resonated with them. Um, imagining having 70% teachers. We don't have that. We're not as fortunate in San Carlos to have our own. So, and it's really hard to find teachers there. Um, everything impacts that retention of teachers and there's just so many variables to it. Housing and right now we're closed off from going back in because most of our teachers don't live in school housing. We don't have very many school housing uh, available. And so it, 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 made, it makes for difficulties, but our teachers that are from ba different backgrounds, they bring a wealth of, of knowledge. And I'm so, I, again, I'm so blessed because I've learned so much from our Filipino teachers and they, and I had that experience at Window Rock as well because we had uh, some teachers from the Philippines as well. And I know they're, they're pretty much all over right now. Um, but um, I know that one time I asked the group, I had them working on curriculum mapping and I noticed that they just would stay late, work late. So they have that work ethic about them. And I asked them one time, well, why are you guys so like, I was trying to ask, why are you so, why do you love this work so much? And it was because of their background of where they're coming from and it was expected of them. They didn't get paid extra stipends for that and they didn't get paid extra, you know, it was a part of their job from where they came from. And so I was really impressed with their, my discussions with them in the past and the same thing I'm experiencing now. We have some of the best teachers ever, especially the ones that I watched at the high school with this online learning that they're doing with Schoology that they're using. It's just amazing uh, the work that they're doing. Um, I was just so looking forward to see how we were going to score this year because I was watching the instruction all year. Uh, our sophomores were ready to take that test when COVID hit and so we didn't get to take the the ASMERIT test but you know that's because of those teachers that we do have that bring in that diversity, they know what, what it's like in other countries, let alone in the United States. And so it's really important. And what I see in them is that they, they love, like myself, like I said, I'm a visitor in San Carlos. I'm, not, I'm an outsider. It's important to learn the ways of the community, what the values are of the community, their, their sunrise dance. And you know, the, they take part, they dress in their traditional um, Apache dress. Um, they they do these kinds of things, and it makes me feel good that they're they're doing. They're really wanting to be a part of the community, and that's really important. So that's what the kids see, the students see that, and it's important for them to. It resonates with them well too. So yeah, we're lucky to have a, a large number of different kinds of teachers from different places, backgrounds. It sounds like it. Um, I'm going to come out there and visit someday when I don't have to wear a mask, maybe. <laughs> or okay. maybe I should wear a mask, regardless. <laughs> but anyway, so we've got one minute left. Uh, Superintendent Nate, do you want to have the last word on the subject? Do you have any thoughts, additional thoughts? Uh, I'll, I'll let Dr. Dennison close out for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I worked in Chile like a number of years ago. <laughs> so we've worked together and we've, we've uh, it's really, this is a good uh, format to begin the discussions of critical topics like what we're, you're, so thank you for, for having us here talking about this. Uh, I know, um, like I said, I worked in Chin Lee a number of years back. It's been a while. I can't remember how many years ago, but there, and um, I know the comparisons between Chin Lee and other, and Chin Lee's always been one of the best school districts around. So 
it's good to hear what Mr. Nate has done over the last eight years and to have you host this is wonderful. So thank you for having us. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the time you took. I know you're extremely busy, but uh, yes, discussions like this are important, uh, especially now. And uh, you know, we need to support each other and learn from each other. And, and I'm sure our audience is very grateful for everything you had to share. So until next time, take care and be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. Bye-bye. Okay. You. Bye -bye. Thank you.